Hello, it's Scott Manley here. It's March 25th. It's time for another batch of Deep Space updates. And while we have had some very big events in the last couple of weeks, we're going to start small on the 12th of March with Rocket Lab's Electron flying out of Mahia into a sun-synchronous orbit with a mission called Owl Night Long. That is a, a launch for Synspective with their Strix 3 satellites and obviously paying uh, homage to Lionel Richie's uh, All Night Long. There is actually a piece of art showing an owl in the red jacket from that video. Uh, but yeah, that's the final launch for Synspective. And uh, moving onward, 13th of March, lucky for some, unlucky for Kairos. This was the first big failure of the year. Yeah, actually, a uh, failure before SpaceX and Starship flew, right? So Kairos is an acronym for Key Based Advanced and Instant Rocket Systems, but it's also like a Greek term for meaning the moment is now. It's like related to Kronos. But yeah, this is an 18 meter tall, one and a half meter wide, uh, 23 tons, 250 kilograms to orbit solid rocket engine system built in uh, Japan by IHI, who you may know, remember if you watch my video on the Japanese launch vehicles. Um, so yeah, this launched out of their beautiful little spaceport, nestled in the hills. It flew for a few seconds, made a quick turn, stabilized, and then five seconds into flight, exploded. Yeah, I spent more time describing the flight than it actually happened. It was wild. And it's not really clear exactly what happened because we've got, you know, business communications combined with communications in another language. We do know that they mentioned the flight termination system, but it's not clear whether that was actually what caused the explosion or whether that was a reaction to a failure which was obvious or that we didn't see. What we did see is that the origination of the explosion was between the first and second stages. So that could well be a bulkhead disintegrating and then the engine, you know, the blast flows upwards. But all the subsequent stages had their bulkheads blown out so that they didn't fly out of control and land in the wrong place. It was spectacular, but uh, it was largely contained very, very quickly. Uh, moving onwards, 13th of March. Again, lucky for some, unlucky for Long March 2C. Uh, out of Ch uh, Chichang, it carried two satellites called DRO A and B. So these are a pair of satellites that were supposed to research distant retrograde orbits. That's the kind of orbit that Artemis 1 went into around the moon. So the launch was fine, but then the YZ-1S uh, upper stage failed to deliver them to the target orbit. It seemed to run about 150 meters per second short in terms of delta V. And as of today, we're seeing objects with an apogee of about 250,000 kilometers as opposed to like the 400,000 that you would expect if they were going to the moon. So yeah, second failure. And so now, 14th of March, I got up at 1.30 a.m. so I could be on all sorts of live streams and things like that with NASA spaceflight and the BBC. And, uh, you know, the launch was delayed about an hour and a half before it finally went and it took off beautifully. It looks like there was some uh, issues with the launch pad, but you know, stage zero is having some changes and upgrades, which is not totally unexpected in such a test program. Uh, Ascent was, you know, was on the money. Not The visibility wasn't great. A lot of people didn't get great footage of the launch from a long way away, but we certainly had some great footage from up close. Stage separation was far more successful. We saw the booster flip and start to come back and perform its uh, descent. There was no, there was a proper boost back which shut down slightly uh, asymmetrically. Some people thought that that was uh, an intentional to cause some sort of flip. I'm not really sure about that. That doesn't really match up with the fact that the engines didn't really come on properly later. So I suspect they had a, an engine failure sometime during shutdown, perhaps like a fluid hammer related thing. But yeah, as it came back down, uh, it, it, I think another thing that was uh, suspected is that one of the grid fins may have failed, perhaps due to blast from the hot staging, because we saw that it had a very hard time controlling itself aerodynamically, and that would be consistent with perhaps a grid fin being jammed. And then when the engines lit, they didn't really light and it blew up about 500 meters above the surface. I'm wondering if this was a flight termination event. It wouldn't really have mattered. A couple of seconds later, it would have smashed into the ocean. Uh, moving on, well, so, so moving onwards, sorry, to the second stage, which of course continued downrange and into near orbit. And so let's get the terminology clear because I've, I, this is, complicated. It was at orbital velocity, at orbital altitudes, 
in a suborbital trajectory, right? If you look at the apogee and the perigee, the semi-major axis was above the surface of the Earth. Therefore, it had, it had a low enough eccentricity, it would technically be orbiting, although it would probably be, you know, not stay there very long due to atmospheric drag. From there, it had three tests to do. It had to test the door, which um, doesn't look like it was hugely successful. They had to pressurize the interior of the top, the top of the starship so that it, you know, to add some sort of structural strength and rigidity. And that appears to have interfered with the door opening mechanism. Secondly, they were supposed to do their propellant transfer, and we've heard that mentioned, haven't really heard whether it was a success or not. Thirdly, they were supposed to relight the engine. We know that that didn't happen, and at that point, the vehicle appeared to be spinning slowly. And probably, the, from what I hear, most people think that one of the thrusters got stuck open, and so the rest of the propulsion system you know, was trying to counteract that, and eventually it sort of would have run out of uh, propellant, or at least had very low reserves to control its entry. So by the time it went to light its engine, it was spinning in an orientation which wouldn't really allow the propellant to flow correctly. Then when it got through the re-entry uh, process, well, um, it hit in a spin and it wasn't able to recover using aerodynamic means and so it eventually burned up after providing some of the most spectacular footage that we have ever seen in the history of rocket science. So um, yes, a partial success, but more successful than the previous one. Looking forward to IFT4, which may be sooner than we think. So moving onwards, the 16th of March. Yes, we had uh, Falcon 9, Starlink uh, out of, uh, out of uh, Kennedy. 23 Starlink satellites, great. And a few hours later, another Falcon 9 out of Vandenberg. It was a dusk launch at about 722 PM, it was dark-ish in SoCal, still kind of you know light in the North Bay where I was. But uh, yeah, I got to see this. It was a beautiful plume of smoke heading up. A uh, lot of really cool imagery out of, you know, like San Diego, even out over in Arizona. So this was supposed to be mainly Starlink, but out of those 20 Starlink satellites and two Starshield launches, which were tagged USA 35, 350 and 351. So these are launches for the Department of Defense, and we're not sure what they're doing, but they're now being launched on Starlinks. 20th of March, China launched a Long March 8 carrying uh, a Chichao 2, which is a relay satellite um, to go around the moon. So Chichao 1 went into a lunar halo orbit, and it was able to provide communications for the uh, far side landers of Chang'e. So this one isn't actually doing that. It's going to provide polar communication. So it's just entered the lunar orbit and it basically is in like a, a 24 hour orbit, which is highly eccentric and uh, goes to the South Pole. So it's technically in a 62.4 degree orbit. And that number is very important because the moon, moon's gravity is lumpy due to mass, cons, mass concentrations inside it. And if you pick a random inclination, it's very likely your orbit will decay and smash into the moon. This 62.4 is a magic number which is stable for about a decade. So the orbit is 200 kilometers uh, selenocentric perigee and uh, 1600 kilometers apo, no, not apogee, apoapsis, aposelene, that's the correct term. Pardon my uh, Latin, is it Greek? I don't know. <laughs> but yes, this will be providing communications for future uh, Chang'e missions. Uh, you know, Chang'e 6 is going to be coming up soon. Uh, it also launched with a couple of other satellites called Tiandu 1 and 2. And uh, the lunar orbiter itself contains a couple of experiments. It has a little uh, like EUV camera and it has a neutral atom sensor. And also it's going to use the large like 4.2 communica uh, meter communications dish that we'll use for communications in synchronous with a ground-based radio telescopes to provide very long baseline imagery with a baseline of the, the moon. So it, that in theory could see much higher details than many Earth-based telescopes. And will uh, be interesting to see if they can actually resolve anything new and interesting with that. 21st of March, we had a Long March 2D going to low Earth orbit carrying uh, six Yunhai-2 meteorology satellites. 21st of March, Rocket Lab flew live and let fly um, from the Mid-Atlantic Spaceport, also known as Wallops. So this was the Razor 5 technology demonstrator satellite and three CubeSats. 
So Razor is, is an acronym for Rapid Acquisition of a Small Rocket. And this is the first National Reconnaissance Office launch on an Electron from Wallops in Virginia. Okay. 21st of March, again, CRS-30. Yeah, all the spaceports getting used, right? This was the first flight of a Dragon from Slick 40. So SpaceX now has two pads in Florida, which can be used for the Dragon spacecraft. Just in case, say, they're landing super heavy uh, at, you know, at, uh, launch complex 39 and, uh, yeah, things go wrong. So this launch C uh, CRS-30 is obviously Space Station Supply Mission. It's uh, docking to the Nadir port of the Space Station, right? Also, the Zenith port of the Space Station, pardon me. Uh, that includes seven CubeSats, which will be launched. Four of those are from Ilana. That's the experimental launch of nanosatellites for NASA. And three are from the Canadian CubeSat project. So yeah, that launched. And of course, it performed a return to launch site. Epic Sonic Boom, you know the drill. 23rd of March, Soyuz MS-25 got off the ground. So this had uh, Oleg Novitsky commanding, Tracy Caldwell Dyson from the USA, and Marina Vasilyevskaya from Belarus. Okay, I've really mispronounced her name. But yeah, this is this mission was actually delayed a couple of days in quite, you know, interesting circumstances because it, they got down to like less than T-20 seconds, like seconds away from engine ignition and they scrubbed the launch. And it turns out that one of the uh, launch structure mass didn't correctly re uh, retract or detach from the core, so they had to abort. So anyway, this is a crew of three, six months mission on the space station for Tracy, but the other two are coming back in two weeks. So Marina is a Belarusian astronaut, and yeah, obviously, yeah. Uh, she's a flight attendant that, you know, was uh, won a TV competition thing against a bunch of other scientists and things like this. Uh, so she's going out for two weeks. She will return on the MS-24 spacecraft with Oleg. And uh, this is actually, interestingly, the first time that a Soyuz has launched with the dudes outnumbered by the ladies, as we say. I mean, so Oleg was also, by the way, the ISS commander when uh, Russia was shooting their space movie earlier in the year. But yeah, I'll say that the landing is not going to be the first time because if you look back previously, we had Peggy Whitson and a Korean astronaut Soon Yi, I forget her name. But yeah, they both had a, a descent and it was quite a, a harsh descent and landing. But anyway, um, God, you know, Russians, apparently, uh, they're really going to be calling out the bad luck. It just seems to happen all the time. I think there's some intentional sabotage on the work of ground crews. That's my excuse. Uh, 24th of March, there was a Starlink from Florida from Launch Complex 39A. And on the 25th of March, less than 24 hours later, a Starlink launch from Slick 40. And I'm going to say at this point, you know, really booster recovery is their sort of limiting factor for launch cadence. You know, they can in between launch these missions that allow RTLS, but otherwise they have to, you know, land on the barge and drive the barge back and unload. So yeah, let's let's see. So Starship, as we know, success slash failure, whatever you want to call it, I'm definitely saying successful, um, more successful. But uh, at this point, it still is officially an FAA mishap because things didn't go exactly as they laid out in their plans and therefore you're required to investigate, submit your report and the FAA will say, fine, that's great. Let's, uh, you know, then we can launch again. And by the way, the FAA, Office of um, Commercial Space Technology Licensing or whatever, part of their budget request for 2025 is a huge increase to make it easier to issue those launch licenses to SpaceX and other uh, you know, rocket companies putting their uh, commercial vehicles out there. Now, SpaceX is already getting onwards with IFT-4 plans. They rolled Starship uh, 29 out to the test stand and performed a, an engine test like today. So, yeah, they're getting on with this and it sounds like they're ready. I mean, you know, we noticed there was never a full-up booster test fire for IFT-3. They're getting, uh, you know, more, you know, they're feeling more reliable. They don't need to integrate the entire stack and test it. Also, on the same day as SpaceX was wowing everyone with giant destruction and explosions and fire in the sky, there was almost a more, potentially a Bigger decision, you know, news story happening out in Washington, right? The Federal Communications Commission, they voted on March 14th unanimously 
in favour of supplemental coverage from space regulatory framework, which is a fancy way of saying that they basically set out the rules that will have to be followed in the framework for cell phone service from space. And so now it, it's going to be, now they know how they're going to license this. The companies can put their proposals together. And, you know, while Starship was very spectacular, more people in the country are going to be directly affected by their phones working everywhere that they can see space. So, you know, that's why I say that while it was just paperwork, it was potentially a bigger impact in the long term for the average person. Um, NASA is uh, going through some, some budget issues, again, because of, you know, requirements to fund SLS with so much money and, you know, attempts to dial back the amount of money that it can actually get. And one of the big knock-on or decisions from this is that they're beginning to draw down the funding for the Chandra X-ray telescope and will eventually be sunset by the end of the decade. And this is, you know, Chandra is still a world-class instrument out there. And of course, it launched on STS-97, which was one of the most dramatic space shuttle launches in history. That's the one I made the video about how a gold bullet almost destroyed the space shuttle. Go and watch it. It's an amazing story. But yeah, uh, Chandra may end with a whimper rather than a big bang. In India, ISRO performed another landing test for their reusable launch vehicle prototype, now called, now called Pushpack. So this is a this is basically a half scale aerodynamic model that they dropped from a helicopter and demonstrated that it could maintain glide control all the way down and touch down on the runway. They are ultimately going to be planning full flight tests to orbit, re-entry tests, all that stuff. They want to have a reusable spacecraft that can return science, can do science in orbit and bring it back. China has one, the USA has one. Apparently this is the, India may be the next country to get one. Um, let, yet another sign that India is starting to pull ahead of Russia as a, in terms of space capabilities. Uh, there was a couple of interesting, you know, cool news stories from Firefly. Northrop Grumman publishing a few pieces about the MLV, which is essentially the next step after Antares 330. Complete replacement for the Antares first and second stage going to be built by uh, Firefly out of carbon fiber and using these Miranda rocket engines, which are being tested. We saw like a five, like five plus second burn, which is important because, you know, you want to get through the first couple of seconds of the engine burn to verify that you've got through like the transient forces and flows and stuff you get during the first seconds of startup and uh, get that stable and then handle the shutdown. And they've demonstrated that they can probably run it to longer and longer times uh, as they are now testing the engine. Another news, Firefly news story was the Defense Innovation Unit. Uh, they said that they signed an agreement with Firefly to study using their Elytra orbital vehicle for missions beyond geosynchronous orbit out into like cis lunar space. So this is like their spacecraft bus, which uh, will, you know, it's it's like electron, sorry, it's like a photon and it'll fly out and carry payloads with it and perform, uh, you know, payload support tasks. By the way, the DIU also recently signed deals with uh, Blue Origin to do Dark Sky 1, which will be like another space tug that will use the Blue Ring platform and uh, Northrop Grumman is going to do a refueling demonstration and uh, Space Built Space Manufacturing Dem a DIU, right? Defense Innovation. They're doing all sorts of innovative things and it'll be interesting when these actually fly. And, and what will be interesting, by the way, watch the skies. So um, we've wondered when this might happen, but NASA and scientists have come on and say that it, between now and September, there's a pretty good chance that there will be a naked eye nova in the Northern Hemisphere, right? So this is a star called T, Bo T Corona Borealis, right? Which is a binary system with a white dwarf in an accretion disk that slowly pulls matter off the parent star. And every 80 years or so, it has this massive nova explosion and it becomes like a second or third magnitude star, goes from basically being invisible to being visible in the sky. So. It's getting time. The last time this happened was 1946. So this will be here for a few days and then it'll fade away. So expect that in the next, uh, you know, few months or so. Uh, Voyager. I was talking about Voyager 1 last week and how it's not really dead, but we might just watch it fade off into the distance in senility, unable to talk to us. But they poked it in just the right way 
And after getting some new data back that they were uns uncertain as to its format, they figured out that they had managed to get it to send back a core dump of one of the computers, right? This is the, the memory state of the computers. And one of the possible problems with it is that they might have had memory corruption. And if they can figure out where the memory corruption is, they might be able to send commands to fix it and they may be able to get Voyager 1 back. So at least it can talk to us as its power goes out and it gets dark and cold. Uh, intuitive machines, speaking of being cold, uh, the Odysseus did not in fact survive lunar night. They were communicating with it for a couple of days. It may have woken up, but it was, uh, there, I, if, if it woke up, it certainly didn't have any power to, con uh, you know, to continue. So yeah, no, no wake up, no talking to us. Australia. We haven't heard about Australia very much, but Gilmore Space, they're getting up get close to a launch. So Gilmore Space is notable. Well, yeah, so, so they're Australian. And this is not the first time somebody's planned to launch an orbital rocket from Australia. Back in the 70s, the UK launched uh, oh, Black Arrow from Australia, right? But now this is an Australian company that has a three-stage launch vehicle called Eris. It's a combination of solid rocket motors, you know, 3D printed grain and um, a hybrid rocket motor, which uh, they say will be able to launch satellites into low Earth orbit from an Australian facility in Queensland, which has just signed its like, got its license and everything for to launch vehicles, but they haven't got their actual launch vehicle yet. So pay attention to that. Delta IV, the last Delta IV heavy is on the pad. After this, Delta IV is dead. And that means the entire Delta series, except of course for Delta V, also known as SLS, which took the upper stage in these for now. And yeah, that whole Japanese H3 rocket, which is sort of derived from Delta and therefore is like a cousin that still flies. And so while the last Delta IV Heavy will be a big deal for us rocket nerds, it won't be the biggest space event for the average person in the next couple of weeks because that will be the Great American Solar Eclipse 2024, which starts down in Mexico, it crosses over through Texas and heads up into the eastern states and ultimately ends up in uh, Canada, but out there the odds of actually getting clear skies are pretty remote. I am going to be down in Fredericksburg, Texas, which apparently a lot of people are going to be in, um, including the Planetary Society and Tim Dodd, Everyday Astronaut. No, I'd love to say that I performed some great planning here by picking you know, perfect location, best weather, but um, no, I just got offered this position by some random person that knew me from the internet and said, hey, I get a space, you want to go? And I'm like, yes, no planning, where do I sign up? Uh, so yes, uh, if you are, if you still haven't planned, it's probably at the point where you want to drive, um, unless of course you're in like Europe, in which case you will need to fly. But uh, yeah, flying in and then flying out either means a very expensive hotel stay for a few days or very expensive plane tickets. But you know, it's it's very rare. It's very awesome. And if you're not in the path of totality, then uh, it's just not the same. And finally, this Thursday, I will be on a NASA live stream from uh, the NASA Ames Research Center in Mountain View. They're going to broadcast on Twitch, Twitter, YouTube, and it's the Viper Rover Build Watch Party, which they've been doing for a few weeks. They've been, you know, basically setting up scientists, experts, watching the build happen in Houston, and just talking about, you know, lunar science and how you build rovers and stuff like this. So Viper's going to the South Pole of the Moon, and I'll be on with the real experts, and uh, hopefully asking the questions, and while they will be answering the questions. And I'm hoping that I will get to say, I'm Scott Manley, fly safe.